Welcome everybody to another episode of Resilient Riches. We have Periel Ashenbrand here today, who is a comedian, writer, producer, podcast host of one of the most amazing podcasts that I've seen, uh, co-hosting with Modi, which is pretty cool. But Periel also does something so unique that she brings a level of fun to what's going on right now in the Israel situation. So it's it's really nice for you to come in. Uh, it's, we really appreciate you coming on and just and just using your platform for good. Thank you for having me. Um... I don't, am I making what's happening in Israel fun? I think you're making, <laughs> you're bringing some light to it. I'm trying to bring a little bit of levity, I suppose. Am I supposed to be looking there or at you? you can what? Look wherever you want. It's a little, okay. No, look at us. Look at you. Okay. Um, I mean, I think that immediately in the aftermath of October 7th, the synagogue that is connected to my son's school turned one of the floors into an emergency center for Israelis who were stuck in New York. And um, there wound up being hundreds of them who were here for one reason or another. And we started working very closely with the Family Hostage for Forum, uh, Bring Them Home Now, myself and a couple of my comedian friends to advocate on behalf of the hostages, thinking that we would be contributing to the conversation in a way that would keep the hostages in the front lines of the conversation, but with satire and something funny because we're not news journalists um, and we wanted to keep it in the forefront and never in a million years did we think that you know, a year later, today's October 8th, we just commemorated one year of, you know, people living in hell in um, these tunnels in Gaza, that we would still be doing this. Um, so I worked really closely with Judy Gold and Daniel Ryan Spaulding. And um, I think the idea was to sort of also expose the hypocrisy and the double standards and this sort of seething hatred um, toward Jews and um, Israel. Well, I mean, and make that really fun and funny. It's just it's different ways of getting to people, and that's the beauty mm -hmm. of when when you're able to be to be able to have a different medium than what people are normally able to do, you're actually able to connect with people differently. So some people do it through humor. Like for example, Zach Sage Fox does it with mm -hmm. humor. He does his, he does his clips. Is he a great stand up comedian? I think he's fine. But when he does his clips, he's like, he's unbelievable. So you guys, it's everybody has different, different yeah. mediums. I, I think that ultimately the takeaway is that each of us can and should do something. And everybody is capable of doing something different. Not everybody has a stage or a platform to scream from. Um, whether it's you're writing letters to the White House or you are putting safety pins on yellow ribbons or what, whatever it is that you're doing, um, it's important. Yeah, it's, it's, it's huge. Um, how is it that you felt all right, let me transition. I'm I'm in this traditional role. I'm writing. I'm doing comedy. How did you feel like, hey, this is my calling. This is what I need to do. Because there's a lot of different causes in Israel, but you felt, okay, very close to the hostages. Can you talk about how you actually got to that point? Um, I don't know that it's just the hostages. I think the hostages are at the heart of this issue. And frankly, I don't even think it's just about Israel. The thing that strikes me is that there are people from... I think 24 different countries, there are still four Americans who are being held hostage. This could have happened to anybody who is anywhere in the world where there is a Hamas or Hezbollah or what, what ISIS, what, whatever it is that could kidnap you from any country. And that this seems to me an international outrage, like not specifically geared toward Israelis. Um, That's why you said when you said originally, it's like a double. Where's the double standard? I'm thinking it's not even a double standard. That's key, keeping it light. I mean, it's just so un, it's, you can't compare the reaction of people to what happened to the Jews. Now that it happens to Jewish women, nobody talks about it. You know, it's not even a double standard. It's like no standard. Well, I think that, you know, and I've said this before, October 7th did not create anti-Semitism, right? The anti-Semitism was there 
clearly for a very long time, that it was just bubbling right below the surface. And now it's been normalized. And I think that there is, you know, this morally bankrupt sort of social clout that comes along with siding with the so-called victims here. Um, And I think it's fucking appalling because you can be pro-Palestinian and I am the first one to say that I advocate for the innocent Palestinians in Gaza who I think as anybody who really knows anything about the history of that region of the world. I know that everybody has become an expert in geopolitics of the Middle East. Until you ask them anything about exactly. geopolitics in the Middle exactly. East. Exactly. Then no one's an so expert. So who's been the biggest victims of Hamas? The Palestinian people. When you're oppressed by your own, it's the same thing. It's who's been the biggest who, victims of any oppressive regime. Who, who's the biggest victim of the Iranian regime? It's the Iranian people. hundred percent. I don't know if I would call them even victims because there's a lot of polls that go through it. You know, maybe not anymore, but at the beginning, you know, did you, are you approving? You know, they go through the people in Gaza, the Palestinians. Are you approving of October 7th? Yes, they approve. Okay. You know, but what are you supposed to say? This is really a question that I don't necessarily have a great answer to when somebody shows up at your house or your kindergarten and says, we're going to take this over. And if not, we're going to kill all of you. Anyway, I don't want to get sidetracked into that. It's a totally different conversation. But my, my, my point here is that when, when, when I'm talking about the double standard, it's that when Hezbollah was responsible for working with Assad in Syria and gassing and killing hundreds of thousands of people, nobody said a word. That, that's the double standard that I'm talking about, that the outrage here is fun because you also get to hate the Jews. Um, so th- those are the conversations that are, I think, really important to me to recognize the anti-Semitism that is going on in this country because my grandparents were Holocaust survivors, because my uncle was a child in the camps, because my entire family was killed in the Holocaust, because I have a child, and because I live in this country. And I think that to let those moments go without calling them out is really dangerous. To allow anti-Semitism to be normalized is really, really dangerous. I agree with you. If you're not saying something to the people actually speaking, then nobody calls them out and it becomes normalized. And then all of a sudden people can say it whenever they want because it's that's they, right. It it becomes like it's like a it's like a joke at a point. Like, that's oh yeah, right. it's just Jews' fault, or like saying like Jewish space lasers and Jewish control. Like these are not okay things to say. Like the, the, I saw a post uh, by Marjorie Taylor Greene the other day and Sarah Silverman called her out and it was really great. And she wrote, yeah, they control the weather, meaning the Jews control the weather. And that's why there's all these hurricanes. And it's like then Sarah Silverman called her out and Sarah Silverman has a huge platform. And if mm-hmm. Sarah Silverman didn't call her out, then I don't think anybody would have rebutted this. Yeah. I mean, I think Sarah Silverman's amazing. And I think that um, that that's at like a very high level, mm-hmm. but I think that you have to empower people who don't have platforms like Sarah Silverman. Um, I think that it's kids going to school. It's, you know, my niece just graduated from Harvard university and she would send me videos of what's going on outside her dorm. And it's like, on what planet is this? Okay. Like that this girl worked her, ass off to get in to, you know, the quote unquote best school in the country. And she has to deal with this. Like yeah. it's outrageous. I, I would say a couple of things we've had a number of people on the podcast also, and they've talked about where is our social media effort been to combat the social media that the Iranians have been bankrolling or the Hezbollah has put out for many years. And it seems like what they've saying, you know, Israel is great with the high tech, But when it comes to social media, they sort of don't really see the necessity of it, except for recently. Mm -hmm. So that, I think, is changing. But we're 
behind the eight ball there. I mean, it's been funded, it's been bankrolled for, for years and years and years. So now we have to get on that so people can respond. You know, even if you go on something, just like it, do something like what you're saying, you know, just go ahead and do something on the social media to combat that because they've been doing it for years. Then we, of course, we've had Shabbos Kestenbaum on and he's, you know, he was suing Harvard for all those things that you're saying that, uh, that you're describing. I mean, he had a horrible time there also. It's good. Crazy. I mean, good. Hold every single person accountable. Every single one. There should be no corner where anybody can put out anti-Semitic material into a school, make Jews feel unsafe. I mean, it is a hard red line. And I think that that is one of the things that is imperative for Jews across America to do. I agree with you. I think it's, I think it's, I actually, it's actually very deep what you're saying, because it's not just Oh, okay. Let it slide. They said it once. Let it slide. No, that doesn't have a big platform. No, they can let it no, no. I, that's something I love about like Jew hate database. Like they are, they are finding these anti semites and they're reporting them. And, Good and making it public and they're getting doxxed. And that's a huge. That's scary for people. I love in also in in Nassau County a few weeks ago. Mozzie Pillip, if you know Mozzie Pillip, mm-hmm. the legislator there, no more masks allowed. Mm. Can't wear a mask. Right. So all of a sudden, the protests are down like by like 70% mm-hmm. because now they can't hide their faces. Right. And I love what you're saying that no corner to hide. They cannot hide mm-hmm. anymore. But I think that was a mistake that happened before before October 7th is that, you know, everybody thought, oh, Hamas, they want to get rid of this, but not really. You know, they, they're just talking. Yes, that, and, that's right. You know, and that's, you know, they're just talking. It doesn't, that's not, we, we can live with them. We can work with them. And I think October 7th showed that that's obviously not true and that what you're saying now is that nobody should be able to hide everything they're saying. If they're saying it, they have to be accountable for it. I think that the Israelis and the Palestinians deserve much better than what's going on right now. And I think that, um, you know, the only way forward is to get rid of Hamas. Like there's no other option. Like, how are people supposed to live like that? But again, I think that, you know, what's going on in Israel is and is not directly correlated to the anti-Semitism in America. Because as you pointed out, I think that a lot of people don't know shit about what's going on in the Middle East. They couldn't tell you the difference between, you know, uh, Malabi and Knafe. You know, they, they couldn't find Syria on a map. So you're not really having like these intellectual conversations no, with people. This no, is not it's, intellectual debate. I saw something on LinkedIn yesterday. There was like an interviewer. He was going around to people. What happened on October 7th? October 7th, you know, they, people, one person after another had no idea what had happened. Yeah. So, so, so you're, so it's not a conversation about that. It's a conversation that people hate Jews. And this is very convenient, right? This is something that they didn't just start hating Jews, right? Now they have permission. That's right. As you said, now they have a platform. Well, now they have... um, They have unity. They have a a large platform. They have a platform. And they never had a platform before. They have... Well, I I think that they have social clout. Like when you're sitting on Columbia's campus doing manicures for, um, you know, Hamas manicures, like that's a real fucking problem. Like these, and like Jewish kids can't go to school and Shai Davide can't do his work because there are hundreds or thousands of people and you have, you know, the administration kowtowing to this bullshit. But that's what, that's what I mean by, by exactly what you're saying. Now they have a platform. They did not have a platform before. Before, they couldn't go out and speak because it was one or two or 10 or 20 of them, and they would just get shunned by the university and shut down. But now they have a platform, and the universities give them a platform to do it, and the media comes in and, inter- and watches them and videotapes them and gives and they give them these tents. And now they're much stronger because now they have a voice. Well, they're being – I mean, 
they're being funded 100%. by they, like somebody's buying tents West, and Westpac, um, which is funded by an ex uh, an ex Orthodox Jew that was living in Israel for a time. He's one of the funders. He receives money from the Soros Foundation. He's, they receive money from the Rockefeller. Brothers. Even the protesters but, when they come, like they come to the protest in, in Teaneck. And we were talking, and my oldest son was talking to them. Oh, how much they got? Well, they got fifty dollars to come. So somebody's paying that money for them to come yeah, and that's, protest. That's what I'm saying. It's coming from this. So, so you're you're going, and I just want to move the topic forward. You're going. You, you see this problem that these people are being manipulated in certain ways, and you said, you know, I have to address it in a different way. I have to address it with my comedy. How how did you tailor your comedy to reach a different audience that not that would not necessarily hear a traditional message. I I don't think I did. I don't think I tailored. First of all, I was, you know, I I don't think I've changed that much in I mean m- maybe that's maybe that's not true. I, I I take that back. I think that um October 7th certainly awakened something in me like it did with many other Jews. Um so, so so that's certainly the case. I, I think that the work, most of the work that I have been doing has been twofold. There's part of it that is, you know, doing videos and comedy and talking about these insane things, like in a way that is really satirical, right? Uh, can you give an example? Yeah. Just a levity of the conversation. Yeah, I'd like to hear this. Um... Sorry to put you on the spot. Wait, no, I, I can, I can. I, 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 I think I didn't get a list of questions before. Um, let's see. I think that you had to, you had to assume that you are. We in like the it comedian. spontaneous. We also. like the spontaneous, but you had to assume that well, you are a comedian. That we were going to ask you comedian questions. No, yes, that's fine. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just thinking about like a couple of the videos that um we were doing. But I'll, I'll get I'll get back to that, or or I can send them to you, and you can clip them in if you want. Um, you can do later. You know. Okay. Yeah. I'll I'll do if, it. If something comes to you, just interrupt. yeah, yeah, yeah. I will. In. I'm just um, I'm just trying to think of what what were a couple of like the funniest videos or the ones that got like the most sort of or whatever um, something you like. Yeah. We'll, 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 we'll take we'll whatever get. you can. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. So, so, but but the other part of it, the other part of it was was that um, you know, people started asking me immediately, like, what can we do? And we built out a platform where we bought hundreds of thousands of toys and worked with uh, two of the kibbutzim that were destroyed and everything sitting in a storage unit in New Jersey because the kibbutzim, the people, again, we thought like two months, we'll bring everything over and we're going to rebuild the playrooms. Um so we have hundreds of thousands of toys sitting in a storage unit that we're going to eventually bring back to Israel and help them rebuild a couple of these playrooms in the kibbutzim that were destroyed. Um, we bought a ton of protective gear for the soldiers, from boots to jackets to backpacks to thermals to watches. Um, and... I mean, we've done, you know, I, I talk but about all that went right. All, the, all that, all the protective all, all, yeah, went. all that went. Um, you know, I talk about, I, th- I think, you know, in a couple of the comedy shows that I've done that, you know, I talk about my husband's Israeli and I have an Israeli mother-in-law. And so I talk about that. And I think that, you know, just talking about that out loud in something that like people can relate to and just to give people like a little bit of, levity is also um a gift for 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 both of us so i have a persian mother-in-law so oh yeah I can, me too I can relate to yeah that. my mother-in-law is from iran oh so yeah it's very yeah. serious yeah, i it's, also have I a call persian her, mother-in-law yeah. yeah actually that's true it's, i call her my shviger if you, a shviger in yiddish is mother-in-law so whenever, oh, I, 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 introdu- whenever I introduce her i go this is my shviger norma and she, she's like blown away because she wants me to call her this like Norma Hanum with nice, like beautiful speech, and yeah. she wants me to just love, just talk to her so nicely all the time. And I'm like, "This is my schwiger. You should. You should speak to her. This is my schwiger. Like and, I do uh, with my mother-in-law. Yeah, exactly. You're so magical. Look how good you are. So your mother-in-law grew up in Iran. My mother-in-law grew up in Iran and still lives in Iran, but happens to be in Great Neck. 
Ha! Right. So funny. Yeah, my mother-in-law um, is in Israel. Where she where she live? In Batyam. Oh, very nice. Yeah, there's a big Persian. So Batyam's my, nice. So my, is it? Sure. <laughs> It's the daughter of the sea. Uh, so my mom, my mother-in-law, my my wife is Mashadi. Do you know what Mashadi is? Mm -hmm. So for our listeners today, Mashadi is a small. So the biggest city in in Iran is Tehran. Mm -hmm. The second biggest city is Mashad. So what happened? A little historical Iranian. So historical, my mother-in-law is from Tehran. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a little history about the Mashadi and Tehrani culture is the Tehranis were were much more educated. So if you see a lot of the Tehranis are very educated, a lot of doctors and things like mm -hmm. that because they were from the city. They were mm -hmm. like the capital, like living in New York City. The Mashadis were from the village. They were mm -hmm. like the suburbs where a lot of the protests were, were in Mashad. And what happened was the Mashadis were getting persecuted by the Iranians, like very, very badly. So they, the story is they called the Tehranis to come and help them and the Tehranis turned their back on them. So the Mashadis all stayed very connected. So my wife has six first cousins that are married to six first cousins. So when I got engaged with my wife, I called her first because I'm like, I'm sorry, I took her from you. Like, I really apologize. And uh, now we're still married with two But, but the Mashadi and the Tehrani, they hate each other. They hate, it's easier to marry a Ashkenazi boy. Let's say you're a female Mashadi. It's easier to marry an Ashkenazi boy than a Tehrani boy. Interesting. And, and each one is supposed to be the honest one mm -hmm. of the group. Correct. Like, which one do you want to turn your back on? Oh, that would be the Mashadis or the Tehranis. You know, each one has their own. You guys are dynamic. deep into this, huh? Well, <laughs> well, I, I support the Iranian people because my wife hasn't worked in about 10 years. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> less than 10 years. Right? They, yeah, five, five it's less years. Than she's retired. Years. That's why. And she's now doing the hardest job of all. You said you have two kids. Have two. So exactly. I'm sure she's working her exactly. ass off. She's working hard. Exactly. Um, yeah. She and you're very... sitting here shooting the shit. So I'm who's who's really working? But in, in my defense, but don't tell her. She played mm -hmm. a lot. We stayed at my parents over the summer and they're still getting over that trauma um not quite yet no i'm still working on it uh it's a long way to go. yeah and they didn't realize the kids um well, wasn't just my the wife kids. my wife was playing tennis every like literally every day like sometimes she would play like two times a day it was like great for her so i was like you're living your best life um so going back to the the question before before we went into a historical analysis how are you able to gear your efforts and use your comedy and approaches I mean, it seems like a very natural gap to bridge, like I think, or bridge to gap, excuse me. I think that um, this is sort of my nature anyway. Like this isn't some like, it's not like just because it's Israel. Like when the war happens in Ukraine, we also sent like 250 boxes of emergency medical gear to Ukraine. Um, I, I think that there i've i i always have like this part of me yeah, it's part of our culture also I, whenever I, there's a disaster who are the first ones that are responding They're sending some technicians from israel yeah i mean i think out. that that's true too but i think that you know i feel so lucky in my life like i've by the grace of god like i'm able to do what i do and i think that this is something that is um really important to me as a person you know for i mean i i've done this kind of work in addition to everything that i do in comedy forever you know we've done like there's a organization in brooklyn called children of the city that helps um really like low income and shelter families they're an education based organization in sunset park and since i don't know for the past like 10 years or something like every christmas we you know it's not it's not just me like i just have a bigger mouth than everybody else but we've gotten together and we get you know hundreds of gifts and diapers and everything for like these mothers and these families so every child has a christmas present and we take um you know, diapers for all the moms and warm jackets. And, you know, there, there's a mother there who I sort of adopted who is Muslim. Um, she's a single mom from Morocco. She has five kids. And I met her, you know, probably like seven years ago and sort of adopted her. And every year we get all five of the kids like boots, jackets, warm clothes, 
you know, everything you can imagine from top to bottom over Christmas time. And this year we got her daughter, um, who's in high school, a laptop and That's serious and headphones. I mean, people are donating their like I'm surrounded by very generous and incredible people, which yeah, is how I'm able to do this. Um, I just start calling people and I'm like, it's time to sh show up. Um, but I have a very good girlfriend from childhood um, who is from Egypt. She's Egyptian Muslim and she and I went together. I thought it was like a really important thing to do this past year. And we sat down with the um, high schooler and we said, you know, just want you to know that like she's Muslim. I'm Israeli. She's from Egypt. I'm from Israel. And we have been friends since we're 15 years old. And a lot of Jewish people donated so that you could have this laptop. And this girl was in shock. This is a girl who lives in Brooklyn, who goes to school in Manhattan. And she was in shock that Heba and I were such good friends. And you know, I said, th this is really important, right? This is really important to show that th this is why New York is amazing. This is the way it's really supposed this to be. This is the way that it's supposed to be. And, you know, I, I don't see that really as separate from my comedy. You know, I mean, no, but it's part, it's, it's using your relationships yeah. and, and being a catalyst for something. You have the direct connection to the person who needs it. And that's very, very hard. So we have like clients of ours that are super, super successful. And they're like, yeah, I gave all this money. And this is right at the beginning of the war. I gave, I'm giving all this money. And we're like, well, we have direct contact to the actual soldiers. There will be no middlemen. There's no right, that's, transportation That's fees. my thing. So we went direct. Yes. And people, I mean, people were opening right at the beginning. It was so easy. We raised like $1.4 million. Wow. Like right away. That's incredible. And then we just did this Torah. And that was like, that was I'm very curious on how you got into comedy and where, how did all that happen and how did that start? Did you think that you were going to be like the next, uh, I don't know, uh, I don't know which comedian Sarah to Silverman say. say. Well, Sarah Silverman is a little young for me, but I'm thinking about Joan Rivers. But I mean, yes, I, no, 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 that's not true. Joan <laughs> Rivers, him, no. not for you, for him, maybe. He never Joan Rivers is a hero for all of us. Um, actually, she really is. Uh, it was actually Howard Stern. Okay. Um, podcast on King. serious yeah well it was before, when i was a kid it was there before, was there yeah, was no was serious on, yeah. but i grew up um with my to, he wants to go into the background of i Sirius didn't Sally do it Radio. i wasn't gonna do it <laughs> um i would my mom would drive me to school i grew up in queens and my mom would drive me to school and i would force her to let me listen to Howard Stern. She's very racy then. I mean, yeah, which was, was very, very, yes. Yeah, was and she brutal. was scandalized. Yeah, that was um, scandalized. But, and, and Andrew Dice Clay. So this was in, you know, the uh, late 80s. Yeah, or, yeah. Um, and I remember feeling like, and everybody always said, you know, you're such a good writer, you should be a lawyer. That's what everybody always said to me. Um, and, you know, I have a big mouth as we've mentioned. So you should be a lawyer. And I didn't want to be a lawyer. Like that sounded so boring to me. And when I discovered Howard Stern um, and, and, and Andrew Dice Clay, I felt like everybody had been lying to me. Like, it was like, wait a second, this is a thing that you can do in life. Um, and you know, they, they were telling the truth and they were hysterically funny too, but they were telling the truth in a way that I had never heard adults really talk like that before. And um, I think that, so from a very young age, I think that, you know, that was something that I loved. And I also, I remember for my father's birthday one year, I bought him a cassette tape of Andrew Dice Clay. And my father worked for uh, the Karen Kayemet my whole life. So we would go to Israel. And my mom grew up in Israel. She was actually born in Palestine on her birth certificate. It's Palestine. Um, and I, anyway, that's an aside. You're more Palestinian than many Palestinians. <laughs> You're a real Pal this is a real Palestinian. <laughs> um, and I got my father a cassette tape for his birthday. And I, he's, he's not somebody who like talks a lot, my dad. Um, 
and he was crying. He was laughing so hard. <laughs> so I think that like that was something that affirming, affirming. It was just a really meaningful exchange of, um, you know, it's so much fun to make people laugh. Like it's fun. It gives you it's nachas, it's joy, it's a gift to be able to do that. And you know, I. I, I think that I started writing then when I was in college and, you know, uh, and then when I was in my 20s, like I started to take it really seriously. And I wrote my first book and we sold the book and it was published by Penguin. It's called The Only Bush I Trust Is My Own, which also stemmed out of like political work, which was, you know, I was very anti-Bush. And I... That's what I thought you meant by the title. Yeah, it, it was. Oh, it, okay. it started from this like political movement against against George Bush. And um, of course, you know, it's a double entendre and all of that. But like, you know, I was in the streets protesting George Bush and for forever but you had a different career at the time like what were uh, no, you doing when trying, you got out of college i was trying to be well when i was when i got out of college i moved to bangkok for a year ah, cool. and i taught english first grade because you know why not and then i came back and i did my uh, master's degree in creative writing and then i moved to la to write comedy for tv that was the dream and i was trying to do that for a while and you know, was starting to get some success. And, but then my writing partner decided that this was like, he said to me, there's no way I'm moving to LA with you to write comedy for TV. This is the worst idea I've ever heard. The only, it, the, the chances of us succeeding are so minuscule. They're so infinitesimal that the only way I would be willing to do this with you is if the world were about to end. And then 9-11 happened. And we drove to LA. <laughs> That's the right way. That's good. At least, um, but at least he, there was some something in the contract. Yeah. So he he was a novel. He wanted to be a novelist. So he hated all of this Hollywood and the comedy. Like he's someone that you grew up with. Is that he some... was my best friend from graduate school, and he's a brilliant writer. And you know he's. But this was not anything that was interesting to him. This was like my my thing. Um, he wanted to be like a serious novelist. Or he wanted to be, he, he, and he is, and he wanted to be a serious novelist and, you know, n not write like yeah. nonsense as far as he's Jokes concerned. About Bush. Yeah, exactly. So, but I wound up writing a book and selling it and then I moved back to New York. So I was trying to be a writer is what I was always trying to do. And, um, you know, I got a little sidetracked that we the, we shot a pilot of the first book and um, but I got sidetracked into some other, you know, career Getting stuff. Married kid. No, 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 no. That wasn't until much later. Bro. I had zero interest in doing that, actually. I didn't, that's, I, how, that's how they get you. Yeah, that is how they get you. Uh, uh, you, you know, you go to the wedding and you're like, you're like, oh, love does exist. And then you go. Knock that off, and you try to shake it off. You. No, it wasn't to you. Maybe it, that's what yeah, happened it, to yeah. you, and so now you're married weaker. with two kids. Yeah. That's what no, it, it wasn't that. It was just that you know that was never like a life goal of mine. Like some people, you were a career. You wanted to be a writer. I wanted, you to, wanted to be a writer. Be, you How your life creative. has changed. You do so much for the kids now. I know. I know. Well, I think when you marry an Israeli, there's like something hidden in the contract that you have to have kids. Yes. Yes. <laughs> for that sure. Is yeah. True. That I is didn't. True. I didn't read the fine print. I have. A, sure. I have a, That's my, how they get you. Yeah. They don't read it. It's so small. Yeah. You can't really. And it's read in it. like Aramaic, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Um, and then I got sidetracked with. Uh, you know, I had an amazing. I worked with the, Mark Seliger, who is an incredible photographer for many years, and I did a lot of work with him. And we also always did. We had a photo. He had a photo gallery that I really ran and did a lot of like creative direction and design and branding and merchandise. That was how the first book came out. It was based on a t-shirt that I made that said the only bush I trust is my own that went viral before viral was a That's thing. Um, so LA writing in LA, was that as difficult as I've heard and that it seems like yes. it is? like totally difficult, right? I don't think that people go into being like into becoming a writer because it's an easy thing. I think that people go into becoming a writer because they love writing and they feel like this is, I mean, this, there's nothing else like I should be doing. Like well, I knew what that I've seen is some of them, they, they want to be performers, but they don't have a platform out in LA. So they, they become a writer on somebody else's show and hope that they're going to get a that's spot. A, but that's a great gig to be a writer on a show is an amazing job. 
I mean, I wound up coming back to New York because I sold my book and my writing partner was like, I don't want to write um, screenplays and TV shows anymore. You know, you're like sending stuff yeah. out and it's um, it's a but I think any thing that's worth doing is like that. Sure. I, I don't think it's exclusive to being a writer. If you want to be like a heart surgeon, like you have to do the same thing. Right. Yeah, um, I agree. And then, um, and then, and anyway, so then I worked in, you know, all this other stuff. And at some point, um, probably, I don't even know how many years ago I said, like, I'm done doing anything that isn't related to writing and comedy. Smart. So you uh, re I recommended. Yeah. I re I, I wrote a second book and my second book came out like 10 years ago and that's called on my knees. And that was published by Harper Collins and, Feel like okay lightning doesn't strike twice like i've been given like this opportunity um and i'm going to really take it i wasn't planning on being married and like pregnant when the book came out so the book tour was Surprise. off yeah Surprise. um and then i wrote a column for a couple of years for tablet magazine i'm sure you're familiar with yeah, of course um which was called the chosen ones where I was interviewing famous and high profile Jews in New York. And that was really great. I got to interview a bunch of very interesting people. And that was how I met the owner of the Comedy Cellar. And I had said to him, you know, if you ever need a producer, I'm trying to get into comedy and he had, they had, they already had the podcast and, you know, whatever, a few years or a year went by and we wound up connecting again. And I've been producing the show for, I don't know, six, seven years. Yeah, it's now. an amazing, it's it's an amazing ama show. It's really it, an amazing show. It's an amazing show. Um, Noam Dwarman, who's the owner of the Comedy Cellar and the host of the show, um, is really a remarkable person. And it's also co hosted by Dan Natterman, who is, you know, a great comedian. Um, and I always say, you know, I feel lucky to be in the room. Yeah. These uh. are, these are like, these are legends. These mm -hmm, are real. Mm -hmm. I, I also love with the comedy seller, how pro Israel they are, like how pro they just go, this is our stance and we're going to stay into this stance. It reminds me like a little bit of like what Oracle did after October 7th. They're mm -hmm. like, this is our stance and this is where we're going to be. And this is, we're not changing. And Oracle obviously is a little bigger than the comedy seller, but how powerful they were i don't know what oracle Oracle's is the, so in your so, world maybe so, it's bigger so, than the comedy side yeah there's 60 billion of revenue <laughs> he's just waiting for I, you to ask i have him. i have, I have waiting he brought it up for i have no ask him. i have in my world this they is, don't even this exist this will be so. interesting for for just the listeners so oracle if you you know you go on the dmv website no, I don't. Have actually. you ever been on a website of the government ever? I have, unfortunately, okay. so, much to my chagrin. Exactly. So you know you go on the site and it has to be hosted somewhere and all this data is going to some hub. Mm -hmm. That's all Oracle. You interact with Oracle probably three to five times a day. Okay. So they're so Why big. are you so into Oracle? Oh, I'll tell, I'll you, tell, you, tell you. I'll tell you why. You. So it's Oracle coming. is a $60 billion a year revenue company. Okay. And when October 7th happened, um, Larry Ellison, the CEO, I, for, I forgot her name, I heard her speak the other week. They said, okay, we're going to make a stand here. Now, Oracle's huge. So we're going to $60 put, billion, dollars, I've understood. It's, yeah, it's serious. So they put on their, on their website a huge flag of Israel saying, we stand with Israel's right to exist. We stand with Israel. We stand with, for the IDF. And we stand like with our people or something like that. And you couldn't scroll down, you know, like, oh, it's a little banner. And then you scroll down. No, they would like follow you down the website. Not only did they do that, they then put it in every, because they have websites in the, every region in the world. They put it in their local language. So you're talking about like somebody in like Syria that's going on the Oracle website with a huge Israel flag that's following them. So now they can only see half a screen. Then what they did, and they put it in their local language. So in Arabic, it's saying we stand with Israel. Then what they did was they took all this new weapons defense systems and handed it to Israel for free. Sounds like their um, revenue might drop pretty soon. <laughs> no, they don't have, they don't have a, so, and, and so the opposite of that, they are so strong that the, the head of Qatar, or they didn't say the country, but it's obviously Qatar, called them up and said, Please don't leave our country. We are 
so helping Hamas, we support we support Hamas, but please don't take your services out of our country. They don't have a supply issue. Right. They have a that's great. They they, they don't have they have so much demand they can't reach the supply. So you're talking about like the sheiks and the sheikhs or whatever they call them are calling Oracle and say, please don't leave us. Like it's really, really amazing. It's similar to Comedy Seller. Like you are I don't know if it's similar, similar to the comedy you, seller, but, in, but it's in interesting. New York, in New York, thing. it's the same, <laughs> almost same. I but actually don't York, think it has, it, it, it has anything. No, it does. <laughs> Give me a chance. With Oracle. What's Give the me difference? a chance. Give me a chance. Not a chance. If you want good <laughs> comedy in New York, you got to go to the comedy seller. I mean, yes, the, the that's true, but I think that there are uh, a lot of places to get good comedy. You want comedy. the best comedy. In yeah, the seller. The seller is amazing. The seller is amazing. Um, you, you've had these like amazing moments in your life, just hearing from this, this conversation and, and you're, you're very tough and you've, it basically just seems like you go into whatever's the most challenging route. And that's the route that you choose. Where did that toughness come from? And what was that like defining moment in your life that allowed you to be so tough when things are challenging, you pull from that energy? Um, I don't know if I'm so tough. I mean, I don't know that you're using a platform to speak for Israel. Is that tough? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I I don't know that I really let's say true to yourself. Well, we can say tough if I mean we can do both of them. I mean, I don't think I really don't like. I don't think that I'm doing anything particularly remarkable. I think being stuck in a fucking tunnel is tough. I think that um, you know, th this is easy. Like this is, and I said this, I told you, I did an event last night at Sixth Street Synagogue with Rabbi Gav Bellino and the comedian Modi. And um, this was part of the speech that I gave last night is like, this is the least that we can do. Um, I, I don't think that this is anything remarkable. But, but you know, there's many people that don't even have that attitude. Well, I think that, I think that people want to help. I think that there are a lot of people who want to help and they don't know how to help. And so those of us, and it sounds like you both did the same thing. If you raised yeah. $1.5 million, um, that I think that you make it easy for people to do what they can do. Um, so uh, I think the tough part is my sister-in-law has the tough part when her youngest son is being sent at 18 years old into Gaza. Yeah, of you know, my, my nieces and nephews who are in bomb shelters in Israel, like that's tough. Like, I think this is the least that any of us can do. I, I have to, I have to relate this to what Michael Rappaport said when we did our, our live podcast, not to Oracle. No, because the Oracle blew people away how amazing they are you said um, this oracle story already it's done you got a few stories you repeat um when serious <laughs> say, I, I say about serious satellite radio you say want anything about serious yeah satellite. so um it reminds me of michael Rappaport and i and i asked uh, the same question like why how are you able to do that he goes because then i look at the neutral family and i look at these families that are just going through the alexander family they're going through such hell yeah this is easy and and what's interesting it's it, it actually reminds me a lot of your comedy, your life is to be able to have tough comments and conversations on 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 touchy subjects. Like you're used to going yeah, that's into the true. fire. That's and true. same with Michael. He's used to that. Yeah. That's what he does. I mean, when you stand up in front of, you know, a group of people for a living and, you know, bombing on stage like that i guess that gives you a little bit of a thick skin but um yeah i i mean i think that what michael what said yeah. what michael said i really agree with you know um yeah well you think of what the hostages has have been through and like that's tough yeah, but i think like one of the points that what we try to do when we talk about those those moments in your life that activate you know who you are maybe the one when you brought that cassette home for your father and you saw how much comedy meant. Maybe that, like, yeah, wow. probably, probably. I mean, I think also I grew up in New York City. Like, I think that at a very young age, if you grow up in the city, um, you see a lot of injustice. And you know, I remember, you know, volunteering at like an abortion clinic when I was like fifteen years old to help women, you know, do whatever, make photocopies that like, I think that you know, 
helping the homeless people, you know, helping this, this family um, that I was talking about earlier. You know, I, I think that like when you are blessed, like it's your job to pass that along in whatever way that you can. Well, some, you know, in, yeah, in Judaism, we'll say that we are blessed so that we can pass right. it along. Right. That's the reason that we are that blessing. And if you don't do it properly, if you don't take that blessing correctly, then why do you have it? And it might be taken away. Right. I mean, I, I didn't know that. That's interesting. I think that, um, Modi actually had told me that the, the, I'm not, I'm going to try not to mess this up. The, 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 the Rebbe of, um, the Babacher Rebbe. Yeah. Said of Oracle. Of Oracle. No, I'm joking. Oh. Bring, had to bring uh, in, uh, okay. So, so again. that you, that the first thing you're supposed to do is ask, like, how can I help? Like, that's the first thing you're supposed to do. It's, it's great actual business advice. Like, genuinely, it's actually great. The first thing we say is like, oh, what can we do for you? Like, you start with that. And so I think that if you can do that, then you should do that. And usually it doesn't have to be like anything big, right? Like, it doesn't have to be like a huge thing. I mean, I think it's just like a human nature thing and it has nothing to do with being Jewish, frankly. Not, not everybody has that thing. There's something that, um, I, that this, there's some famous story about, you know, somebody who did something for like uh, somebody else and a they said, story. thank you. It's one of, <laughs> it's one of my finest ones that, um, and they said, why am I, the detail. <laughs> <laughs> why am I going to, you know, get a sandwich for this person who, you know this homeless person who just like spit at me I'm making that up but and they said you're doing that not because of who he is you're doing that because of who you are and you know that that's it that's, and, that's what Judaism, Judaism Judaism says like when people come to collect from you you're doing you the favor of allowing you allowing you the opportunity to give to them that's exactly it and so when people are like oh how you're gonna ask this person to donate money or you're gonna ask them to you know give you a storage unit and i'm like they're not doing me a favor i'm doing I'm them, doing a, them yeah, a favor exactly. like i'm giving them the opportunity to do something good like right. they're not doing it for me That's exactly what i was saying to people with the torah it's a it's a really deep point. It's a really deep. I'm point very it. deep. As, as somebody <laughs> from something to somewhere. Well, I thought I was the one that brought that and explained it. All. You're not getting. No, you did. I don't get. You did. I don't get him called. I don't get called deep or anything. <laughs> what do you get called? I don't want to say. It's just a family rated. <laughs> no, she's. Saying, well, I know. I I do. And That's they had Joe it. Paul. You know Joe Paul. Um, maybe he, he said, oh, you he, can beep it out though. I get it. No, I get like it. it. You can beep it out. It was 70% of the episode. No, but we like it. Okay. Yeah. It makes it genuine it makes it and, real. and spontaneous. How can, so how can people find you? How can people follow you? How can people, they can, buy, they can find me on Instagram, uh, at Periel Ashenbrand, P E R I E L. And uh, you can figure out the rest. Just type in Ashen Brand. Yeah, just oh, just now. You're gonna find you it. can find me. Yeah, uh, if you want to find me, you can find me. That's true. Yeah. You're a, you're a hard catch, but yeah. once you get you, one day <laughs> get right. you, you're in That's and you're right. not going anywhere. So Periel, thank you so much for coming. Thank on. you for thank having you for your me. advocacy. We obviously we saw people. Other people were like, "Hey, you got to reach out to her. Like she's really speaking up." And and we really appreciate that. And I think it's so interesting what you said. The I think the thing I took away the most is what you said about how it, it it's not really challenging compared to what other people are doing and you've been able to walk this fine line so well and and that's what you have to do and you've rallied other people to do it that's why maybe maybe that's why just i'm having like an epiphany is that the com the comedians that we've had that have spoken up have such an easy time to continue to speak up yeah i mean here i'm gonna leave you with one brief um anecdote so i have this hostage necklace on which um, is really just to br bring them home. I'm sure everybody who yeah. listens to you probably has seen it. But yeah. I, um, when I get on the subway, I usually tuck it in because, not because of anything other than like, I don't really feel like I want to have a fight with a crazy person on the subway. That's really the only reason I why. Like, I, I don't think that that's a productive way. No, I'll tell you, I have a friend of mine. He's uh, religious. He looks religious, beard and everything. And he was on the subway. 
coming from Brooklyn. This is Benjamin, yeah. and he got attacked by some crazy person. Tried to grab his phone and started yelling at him about the hostages and genocide. That's, that's horrible. And it's some crazy person. Yeah. It's not like a you're not having an intellectual conversation right. with this person. So that's that's horrible. But I think you should be kept keep, keep yourself safe. So I so so I usually tuck it in. And um, I was sitting on the subway at night. You know, I go downtown, uptown, whatever. I ride the subways and don't. For fun, not for. No, no, because I live in New York City and I ride the subways. I mean. That's the way to get around. um, And if you fuck with me, I do carry mace. So just be advised. I'm allegedly. I think it's not legal. But you buy in New Jersey. Yeah, that's right. You buy in New Jersey Um, on Amazon, but they track where you actually purchase it. Not noted noted um but anyway a couple of fun facts in this episode <laughs> and oracle facts that's fun it's, how fun you're everybody's never gonna a, forget that, <laughs> like that whole story about oracle everybody's having a fun time <laughs> tell your husband you know what i heard about oracle today that's true he, he actually might be it uh is, it is, interested it is not but that I'm not interested. I know, I know. I, but anyway, so I usually wear this hostage necklace <laughs> and I tuck it in on the subway and I'm sitting there on the subway and I notice across from me this young couple speaking Spanish. And I can tell that they're tourists because I live in New York my whole life and you can spot a tourist, right? right. And they both have um, gold Jewish stars around their neck. And I took this out. I took out my hostage necklace so that it was sitting there and they gave me the biggest smile and I smiled back at them. But that really made me think that like, that's why it's so important to speak out against anti-Semitism, but also that like, when you do that, you give somebody else courage in a way that maybe you didn't initially think of. You never know your reverberations where it right, goes. Right, exactly. Yeah. Well, so that's it. Thank, thank you. you. For, thank you for doing what you're doing. Uh, and thank you everybody for listening and we'll see you on the next one. And uh, maybe Perio will bring us some of the biggest comedians out there to come on our show. Tell us a joke. Tell us a joke. <laughs> the jokes are not allowed on this I thought episode. the mother-in-law was I was. Gonna, I was for sure. But no problem. Thank you everyone for listening. We'll see you on the next one.